Okay, so uh, I'd like to welcome everyone for the for the new semester here. Uh, hope you're gonna have a have an awesome semester together. My name is Amir Ashuri. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Toronto. This semester, I'll be uh, a sessional lecturer of this course at York. Um, so since I, I wasn't an employee of uh, York, my account hasn't been set up, so I couldn't set up the the website page at York. But um, by the next week, I'll let you know, guys, uh, by an email or some sort of communication. You'll we'll figure it out. Where, where the website would be and uh, how we're going to proceed with that. All right. So for now, uh, before, before the website starts, either the wiki page or I guess you call it Moodle here, um, if, if something happened and I couldn't reach you out, please check my web page at UToronto. So I'm, if I couldn't uh, figure out something, I'm going to post uh, either the slides or uh, some notices there, but uh, I was just talking with one of the uh, IT technicians, so they're going to set that up soon, so we'll be able to have another uh, web page at York, hosted by York. Also, your TAs will be announced by next week. We're going to have a meeting with all of our uh, co-lecturers, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty huge group of students. Uh, in, this in this section, I, I believe we have more than 100 students uh, this is the same for the other two, so we have a pool of TAs, so we are trying to, you know, sort of manage the, the workload for TAs for your labs as well. I guess um, most of you know that you have labs, so um, I have to ask the, the guys that uh, just use, go to your own assigned lab, so you have, you can just check on, on your, uh, you know, semester schedule and then see if you are in uh, 01 or 02 and each of the, I mean both of them are happening in the same place but different days because we are in limited seats um, we would like everyone to, to you know attend their own sessions because if you submit your uh, you know lab assignments in, in, in the other uh, you know session that you weren't supposed to you might have uh, issues with the gradings and so on and so forth I guess the first lab we're going to have will be in two weeks, so not next week. We'll be starting our labs in two weeks. I'll, I'll post another notification before that, so uh, you know, so you guys will be informed. Basically, what we're going to do is um, um, you're going to have eight labs, so four before your midterm and four after your midterm. And for each of those four, if somebody couldn't attend one lab for any emergency, you know, reasons, uh, we're gonna have another makeup. So one makeup for each of your four labs. So one makeup before your midterm and one makeup lab uh, after your midterm to, towards your final. And during each lab, you're gonna have some. Is, uh, you're gonna you're gonna be given some instructions, and you're gonna have a pre-lab, which is following through that instructions using the, the software tools, a simulator that has been built at York. Uh, it's a RISC-5 simulator. I'll, I'll, I'll describe it in details later. So you're going to follow through the instructions, and you would do the, your pre-lab uh, assignments. You submit assignments. After that, you're going to have, we're going to put the, the lab machines in the test mode. And in the test mode, you're going to, basically follow through with what you should have been uh, you know, doing in a pre-lab, but as a sort of a test, uh, test environment. And you're gonna be evaluated both on your pre-lab and your test submission after that. So this is gonna be for one of your labs. So we're gonna have lab one, two, three, four before the midterm, and then five to eight after your midterm. So, uh, so that's just the, the, the general high level idea of uh, what we're going to do with the labs. For the reference of the textbook, I'm sure yeah, you've seen this. How many of you have already uh, obtained this? Okay. So this is a computer organization and design for the RISC-5 edition. In the past, it used to be the, the MIPS edition, but they've, the, the authors um, switched from the, the, the MIPS architecture 
which was done in the ladies, like 80s and 90s, uh, pretty uh, you know, famous and popular. Recently to, to RISC V. So RISC V is an open source architecture designed by University of Berkeley with many uh, collaborators uh, all over the world. And now <coughs> they have released the, the RISC V edition. It, it's a more simplified version, I'd say, of, of the mix. So they have changed the this book, the authors, uh, they, they've changed it to the RISC V version. Um, basically, we, uh, we are trying to conform with the, with the structure of the book with some little tweaks, uh, but mostly that, that's going to be your reference. So I've uh, also put a tentative schedule, but this is subject to change, so it's going to change definitely, and we're going to update it every time. So basically today, uh, I, I didn't mention here because it was just the, the introductory course. I didn't want to use all my uh, time, so starting from next week, you're going uh, to carry on with chapter one, and we start chapter two, then we go towards the rest of chapter two, and probably here because of your first lab, I'll switch some initial uh, courses about chapter three, and then we switch back to chapter two because it's going to help you to, uh, you know, follow through with your labs. So in two weeks, as I mentioned, we're going to have our first lab, and then going forward up to the the reading week, which will be no classes, and then after that, we're going to have the meet after that. So that's going to be a, a, a roughly a rough and tentative schedule um, for this semester. Okay. Um, so the course prerequisite is just a general. Yeah, good. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. So I wasn't. Um, I wasn't at York before. So perhaps you had some prerequisites in order to get this course. So, what was that? What was that prerequisite? Java. Okay. Yeah. So you don't need. Uh, you just need basic understanding of programming. I mean, we mostly work with the uh, Risk Five simulator. So that I just put a uh, put a screenshot here. So uh, this is the high level view of that simulator. Um, so basically, you're going to input an assembly source code. I'll explain what, what that is, if you don't uh, know what assembly is. Um, and then it's going to generate you some lower level instructions that we're going to use in a course. So as an example, so suppose you got an I instruction for two registers. And then it's going gonna, it's gonna to translate into this unknown notation that you, you have no clue right now, but you're going to learn what those things are working. And then uh, the rest of the windows are for memory and other things. So on your, labs, uh, on your lab session, we're going to mostly working on that. And we assign you some tasks to do. And you're going to have the, the output of this, and you're going to report it back normally. So the grade composition uh, would be mostly, I, I simplified it, 30, 30, 40. Uh, probably it's going to fluctuate a little bit, uh, minus 2, minus 3% up and down. But the labs are roughly around 30%. So each lab considered around 5%, um, 4%. And then you have midterm and final. Any questions? I, uh, I saw it. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. You said there was a quiz in that stuff. Does that include the lab? Um, I'll see if that makes it uh, you know, better to have quizzes or not. I haven't decided on that. But for now, I assume you don't have quizzes. You just have uh, free labs and lab assignments. More questions? Okay. All right. Uh, 
so the description of your course is, as I mentioned, is based on the risk five. It's the first architecture that has been designed to be used in modern computing. It hasn't been realized completely yet uh, on a real hardware, but there are many universities and research institutes uh, working on that. It's, it's getting pretty popular. Uh, it has its own advantages. We're gonna we're gonna touch touch on that those, and it has uh, a simplistic sort of design, which is uh, much better currently than the ARM base or the MIPS base, which was there in, in the past. So, what you will learn uh, by the end of the course, so you're gonna understand, first of all, in computer organization and architecture, you're gonna understand what's happening inside your computer. So it's, it's as if you are zooming into your uh, processor and see what's happening underneath when you write the high-level language. And it's going to give you a pretty good idea of, you know, what's happening inside the box. So we are just opening that box and looking into that. Um, so basically by opening that box, you're going to understand how the programs are translated from a high-level language like C, C++, Java, um, to a lower uh, level language that machine understands that, right? And not only that, how the hardware underneath your computer executes them, right? So you're going to learn about hardware and software interface and what actually determines the, 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 the program performance. Are we talking about how fast a program runs? how accurate the, pro uh, the program runs, how fast the task is within that or processes within that program runs, or do we compute that based on the processor that was assigned to that. So there are different methods for that. And finally, you understand how hardware designers improve performance such a way. Okay, so these are just some, uh, some high-level points just to you know, set up your, your um, mind in order to carry on the course. So we had, a, we had many different revolutions in the past, I would say, seven years of introducing computers, starting from the early 50s, late 40s. And so these are some of those. But one of the most important ones are the computers that are, pers uh, are anywhere now. They are used in, in, in the embedded world. They are used in uh, mobile domain. So they are everywhere. That's why they call it pervasive. So they are in everyday life. It's in your you know, smartwatch. It's in your cell phone. So each of those has a different hardware and architecture and design. So this is one of the most important, I would say, revolution of computers in um, history. So in the past, we had a third class of computers in between these two, but not anymore now. So it was a PC, it was a personal computers. But nowadays, by the advancement of the embedded world, those are smaller chips, like your cell phone, your, your um, smartwatch, uh, basically that middle you know, class is gone, and they have you know, diverge into two different extremes. So we have supercomputers now, or we have embedded computers. So in, in the supercomputers, we have the high-end scientific world that mostly they are using that, thousands and thousands of cores. If you just go to top 500 website, basically every three months, uh, or every six months, I guess if, if every three months, they're gonna, they're gonna list the uh, top 500 supercomputers of the world. Um, so you can see how many cores, how many petaflops, uh, how many computations per second they can handle, and they're gonna put it in a, you know, they're fighting for, to get it into that list. Um, also, there is another uh, list for top um, 500 green computers, which the most performant computers regarding the energy efficiency. So there are two different competing lists. And for uh, virtually for countries, it's very important to, to top that list 
uh, and you can see if you see the trend uh, in the past it used to be like United States in the top five now we have Japan we have China uh, and other actors that are trying to build you know um, better and you know more performance supercomputers on the other side when you look into the embedded world embedded computing so we have another class of computers that are very very popular today so if you look at this so the the y-axis represents the the number of devices in millions that are sold so you see the the PC is, is probably uh, plateaued somewhere tablet at some point it got super uh, you know popular and then it came back down so now perhaps in the future we have a sort of a super group of tablet and smartphones and then PCs are as I mentioned plateaued so you see the trend here so and I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard about cloud computing so I'm just not gonna uh, spend more time on that so many of the services you've been using in the past uh, in your personal computer in your local internet, in your local uh, workstation, now they have been turned into services and they are used in a, in a cloud-based manner, right? So, when in this course, when we talk about performance, you need to ask yourself, because we are opening the boxes, we, uh, we are understanding what's beneath the computer, you need to be asking yourself where it comes from. Is it coming from the algorithm? Is it coming from the, 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 the specific programming languages that we are using? Is it coming from the, the memory hierarchy of the system using different cache sizes? Or is it coming from the I.O., the input-output of that system? And that we include that OS inside that. So we're going to touch on all of those. And you want to have a clear idea of when, when we talk about um, an organization of a computer, what components are actually... Uh, having the, you know, having to play the uh, sort of uh, roles into, you know, running a software in, in certain speed or in certain performance, right? Okay. Any questions so far? So these are some some jargons that uh, you're going to see more in this course. So Moore's Law. Does, does anyone know what Moore's Law was? Mm -hmm. Can, can you? The number of transistors inside a chip doubles every certain frequency. Yeah, that was, that was OK. Any, any, any more explanation you can get? So basically, in the late 60s, um, um, Moore's I mean, Moore was the was the researcher who brought this law. Uh, he was basically extrapolating and seeing the trend in, in the in the industry that every certain month, eighteen months or so, the the number of transistors are getting doubled within the same area. That means that their speed was getting doubled every certain month, which on that time uh, he he was predicting every eighteen months. So that given the same size. If you have this, if you fix the size, your speed will become double and double. Or on the other hand, you can half the half the size with the same speed. So your your devices would shrink. And he was extrapolating in up to mid 2010s, and he basically says that if we carry on this trend for these upcoming 50 years, 40 years, at some point the laws of physics cannot allow us to have transistors closer to uh, a certain threshold. Otherwise, they're going to lose their uh, physical uh, you know, nature of a transistor because they're so close that you can't play around as a switch for that. So that, was, that got famous for Moore's Law, and it was basically uh, one of the roadmaps of you know, computer designers. We're going we're gonna to talk about it more. Um, but later on, when we reached to the limit of Moore's Law, we understood that that was not the, the single issue that the computer architecture and the industry was facing. After mid-2000s, like 2007 and 2008, when 
Intel started to generate multi cores, a whole slew of issues brought up. So how are you going to have the performance via parallel uh, cores? Um, either I have a different multi core or each of the cores have different processors inside. Um, how are we going to hand, handle the, the hierarchy of memory? So my L1, L2, and L3 caches, how are we going to play with those in order to have a fast, faster programs? So all of these um, ideas we're going to touch in this, um, in this course. And I hope you're going to have a much better idea of thinking about uh, how a program runs um, in a computer after the course. So basically, uh, by computer architecture, we are spanning right from the hardware up to the application software. So this is basically those layers that the architecture, computer architecture is uh, looking into. So it's, you have your hardware that runs your software, right? And you have a system software in between, could be anything. So computer architecture is the study of the amalgamation of sort of these three and spans from software ends to, to the hardware. So let's just have a quick example. Uh, you, you're going to learn about all those details. Just don't, don't freak out by seeing this. Uh, it just shows you that it's starting from a high level language. In this case, it was C. You could just change it to C++, C Sharp, Java, or, or, or anything. So you have a swap function. So you want to swap the, the values of V, K. So, so you need to have a temporary variable and then you swap these two. So what's happening when you compile this? Use a compiler to run it onto your machine, right? Because obviously the machine don't understand anything about swap. I mean, the machine only understands a binary code, which is this. So the process that we take from a high level language up to a binary code so it is done via, uh, via compilation, right? You compile your code, you come into, a, into an assembly language, language somewhere in between these two, still readable. We're going we're gonna to learn how to read that. It's, it's still readable. And then after that, the assembler is going to generate that um, binary machine readable code for you. So basically, this job of the assembler is done by, uh, in, in your lab when, when you are doing your uh, lab projects. Basically, you don't have to translate this to this. That's the job of your recipe simulator. But in the past, uh, believe it or not, like in 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when the compilers were not that optimal, many of the engineers had to just manually write this. Or just like in your... In your first page of your book, um, if somebody told me he, he already obtained the book, so the first page is, is a green page with all the um, assembly language sheet for the RISC-5. You see it's a green page? So it, it, was, it was called green card in the past. So they, they could fold it in their you know, pocket, and then at some point, they had to just open it up and then see, oh, this, this instruction will translate perhaps to this. So I have to write that. Because there, there was not uh, a, a, an optimized compiler to do that. But now we are lucky. <coughs> Everything has been optimized. We're just learning how it, it is done. Okay? So, the component of your computer, um, if you, as an you know, analogy, if you, if you take a look at your computer, this could be a representative of that. So you have you have an input output, right? You input something to that, and then it's gonna output something, right? Along the way, this chain has to be controlled, right? And using the data path, we can understand what data are we going to process and what data are we going to output, right? 
the, the right side represents your memory because it's going to deal with any time you want to do something, you want to load something, you want to save something, you have to load it from memory and you want to save it back to memory. There are some faster sort of um, faster memories, let's say, in a high level speaking, and we call it cache. So, but they're very limited, they're expensive. In general, you have to load variables from memory, manipulate them, and then save them again. And the component that does that, does that manipulation, calculation, and control is your CPU, right? Is your processor. And here we are standing here and pinpointing at the issues and understanding how we're going to evaluate the performance of this tool chain. Input, process, and output. So in a high level manner, so your, your data path performs operation in your data. The control controls that sequence of data path. And your cache, which was your faster memories, you can use it in your benefit in order to speed up your program, right? So we call it SRAM. The good old memory, we call it DRAM in the past. All right. So uh, in computer architecture, we are really interested in abstractions because we are somewhere in between hardware and software, right? We are trying to find a way to have some sort of representation of a computer that doesn't change every time you change your hardware and every time you change your software, right? We want something um, independent from those beneath. So one of, the, one of the perfect ways to define that sort of abstraction is by defining it using an ISA or ISA, some, some, some might say, which we call it instruction set architecture. So this is the, the interface that you're gonna see more and more in this course. And each architecture represents its own ISA. So when we are, when we are uh, telling you that this is an ARM-based architecture because it has its ARM ISA. When we say in this semester, we are talking about the RISC V because we are targeting towards RISC V ISA, right? It has its own set of abstractions. Intel machines have their own ab abstraction, ISA as well. So by having this, you're no longer dependent to your hardware and software beneath. So using that, you can abstract the, the process and workflow of the instructions that are needed to be run <coughs> on your hardware, OK? All right. That's just a trend of technology. So early 90s, the first vacuum tube. If you just normalize it and give it one as a performance of your baseline performance, let's say, you see that by 2013, how many order of magnitudes the performance has been improved by, by having the latest generation of ultra-large scale ICs. So um, I'm not going to go into details because it's just um, an introductory chapter, but in general, um, the whole, the whole processing element comes from this simple notion. So you have silicon, which is coming from the, the sand. So the, a company such as Intel, they can refine the sand and extract the alloy. And I'll show you the process uh, in the next slide. And you know, make something like this, which is sort of a switch. And we call it silicon. Uh, and, and it's a semiconductor. Okay, so depending on how we're gonna switch those and make them positive and negative, so that represent N and P, we're gonna have different switches. So at some point we can uh, we can design an amplifier with that. Another thing we can de design a switch for that, and this switch is is uh, is gonna act as uh, you know when when certain voltage passes, it's gonna turn it on and it's gonna turn it off. So the whole zero and one you saw on, on that uh, binary you know, uh, output of your high-level language, all those zero and ones are going to get executed in, in such a way. It's pretty intuitive. Um, so let's talk about how they're going to get into that, right? 
So they start from the ingots, silicons. They're coming from uh, sand, so a huge pile of sands. They are doing different filtering. And then they slice those, and then they make a blank wafers. So they repeat this process many times, and they pattern those wafers, and they start testing to see, after adding those, those elements, how many of those are going to be workable and how many are not. And that's why we have the yield sort of metric. So the, the proportion of working you know, dyes per wafer. So say if out of six, five of them are working, you see five out of six, right? So one, one out of six wasn't working, so it wasn't yielding performance. And that's pretty much what it takes if you zoom in to 300 millimeter. So that's a 32 nanometer technology. So you have now better even 9 nanometer in your, in your cell phones or uh, CPUs. Um, so it has, it has gone a long, long process in order to make it to here. I'm not sure if you can run this here, but we'll see. What is it? Link, yeah, yeah, I, I, just, I embed it here. So. It should be a YouTube uh, placeholder. Let's see if we can run it on the browser. Yeah. <laughs> 